Hey, what's going on, everybody? <laughs> it's uh, Brian from SecretsBeverageLab.com, and this is a Secrets Beverage Lab podcast for Monday, July 1st, 2013. We've been away for a couple weeks, but uh, hopefully you had a chance to catch up on our past episodes. Uh, the boys and I were in Portsmouth last week, or two weeks ago, talking to Greg Cook, so that's up there. And we got some we got some other stuff in the works, but nevertheless, we got a great guest with us uh, today, and uh, we're excited to talk to him. But again, I'm Brian. I'm drinking the My Antonia by Dogfish. And uh, Carla, long time no t no talk. I know I missed out on your little boys fest down in uh, Portsmouth, but I heard it was <laughs> fun. So, fest, you know, 2013. Little things like <laughs> jobs, you know, had to work, but uh, nope. Have been having a lot of beer fun in your absence too. Um, I'm drinking uh, a Darkness Shed 90 minutes. Uh, one of my called my Desert Island beer. If I was stuck on a desert island with only one beer, that would be it. Awesome. Awesome. We got Mike. What up? Carl um, online is the beer babe. Excellent. Oh, Excellent. and he broke Mike. I love it. <laughs> um, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Mike, what up? Uh, Mike Meredith, uh, at Mo Meredith on Twitter. And tonight I'm drinking a 75 minute from Dogfish. So awesome. Sensing a trend here. Sweet BBC glass, by the way. Quick shout out. Yeah, a little shout out to Western Mass there. Yes. Yeah. Nice. All right. So Western the Mass. Brewing. Represent. <laughs> Speaking of uh, sweet glasses, Norm. <laughs> Worst segue in the world. Metro West Daily News uh, at Real Beer Nut on Twitter. And I'm drinking uh, 2004 Old School Barley Wine tonight. Nice. Jeez. 2004? 2004. Wow. Mike, were you born then? 2004? <laughs> um, I was born in 05. You know, I just yeah, came out looking like this. Great year, great year. <laughs> uh, Sean, what's up, man? Yes, I'm Sean Jansen from uh, TwoBearGuys.com. I am drinking a Miles Davis Bitches Brew. I think it's... Uh, I, I was looking for the dates on them. I couldn't tell. I know it's a couple years old, I think. Awesome. Well, I mean, if you haven't noticed the trend yet or the sign on Sean's wall behind him, uh, we have a very special guest today, and that's Sam Calagione of Dogfish. How's it going, Sam? Doing great, guys. Thanks for inviting me. And I'm do I'm actually breaking the trend, and I'm not having our own beer tonight. Oh, I'm having a nice. oh, switch back. Oh, hold on, keep talking. That's awesome. <laughs> from our Vermont, from our Vermont homies. Oh, he's <laughs> there it is. There's Brian. Gotta, gotta have a good sign for it too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. Keeping it in the family. Yes. <laughs> Well, um, we're going to cut right to the chase. I mean, we, we, we appreciate you coming on, and, I mean, we it's really pretty informal. I mean, usually what we do for a lot of newer brewers in the area, we, we talk about their startup, but uh, you, you've been around for quite a while. And, um, uh, Norm, you're not drinking the beer right now, but you, you wanted to talk about uh, the, the 61 uh, Oh, beer. yeah. It's, no, I think I just, it's a good, a good topic to kick, kick off with because it, it's, uh, it's your newest year-round beer. So, Norm, what do you got? No, I just... It's the first uh, year-round beer that you've introduced since, what, 2007? I'm just wondering uh, what made it, into instead of an occasional release, into something that's going to be a standard lineup. Um, that's a good question. I guess, you know, the, you, know you mentioned you've been, you guys have been talking to a lot of startups lately, and, you know, opportunities to do a full new beer launch kind of makes us feel like we're still in startup mode 18 years into this. And, uh, you know, when we opened in 95, we were the smallest brewery in the country and, you know, opened on the model of any culinary ingredient is fair game for a beer. And flash forward to today, we, we make about 8,000 cases of beer a day, but we still look first towards, you know, the entire culinary world for ingredient inspiration and, uh, and are more innovative because we have the resources to be more innovative now than we were when we were tiny. So we had the luxury of a whole year of R&D uh, to take this beer, which started as just me and my buddies drinking 60 minute and pour, you know, take a big uh, sip off your pint of 60 minute, and then we order one one good glass of Pinot Noir from the hop growing regions, and put a little bit in each glass, and we love that. And I said, hey, we got to figure out a way to get this beer in the bottle. But it, the trial and it, the trial period took a full year because we first tried it with Pinot, and it was too too much tannins, and then we tried it with red Zinfandel, and that, that porridge was too cold, and then we, uh, we found Syrah grapes worked beautifully, so uh, 61 means 60 minute plus one ingredient, and that's the roughly 25% per fermentable sugars that comes from Syrah grapes in that beer. It's not the first time you used wine, too, isn't it? You used it in uh, 
noble rot. And yeah, I mean, we've been doing beer wine hybrids, I think, technically since 96 with Raison d'Etre, and then 99, the first test batch of Midas Touch. So for well over a decade, we've been playing with, uh, with wine beer hybrids. And, uh, as far as I know, we were earliest brewery to play around with those as sort of a, a group of beers, um, other, of course, than thousands of years ago when lots of cultures were mixing grains and grapes. Now, how's the initial reaction been from from the public to, to this this kind of new new style of beer? I guess well, that's been great. I was doing a a uh, farmers market Saturday morning beer tasting across the street here in my town of Lewis, Delaware, and I had irate uh, geriatric people because the sixty one was out of stock at all the local stores <laughs> in our, our neighborhood. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, beer has left. Uh, just this insular community when the 72-year-old woman's yelling at you to get more beer wine <laughs> hybrids. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, geez. As a side note to that, I picked up this uh, four-pack of 90-minute at a uh, gas station in Wiscasset today. So that, you know, kind of pulling that out there, you know, of, you know, this is right next to, you know, the, you know, the typical kind of, you know, macro everything. And it's, you know, selling it enough that they're stocking it up there in West Cassett, Maine. So I just think that's cool. That that warms my heart. And of course, West Cassett's the prettiest yes. little, little village in Maine. And you, ninety minute goes great with a red zeet lobster roll. Oh yeah, yeah I'll have to do now that. Now I'm hungry. Shoot. <laughs> next <laughs> next time I get out early, uh, I work I work in Walpole, so I, I drive through that area um, every day. So. Nice. Now, what, what, was it your was it your idea to to kind of make a I, I hate to say it, Jerry, because I we, we don't have we don't have very many geriatric listeners or, or viewers because they don't really know how to get to YouTube, but uh, or download an MP3. But were, are, were you surprised by by the kind of the elder crowd being being using your beer as kind of more of a, a gateway to craft beer because that kind of beer wine uh, pairing? Yeah, yeah, I mean a little bit, but I think you know since really we kind of noticed kind of around maybe six, seven years ago, right around the start of the recession, that a lot of older folks were coming to our brewery, not older, but 45 plus, I guess I'm right on the cusp of that now, but uh, folks were coming to our brewery, and what we heard a lot was, what, oh, you know, I've been a, a wine lover, wine connoisseur for years, but, you know, I lost one-eighth of my pension or a quarter of my pension, and, and now I've realized that I can get the world's best beers for a fraction of the cost of the world's best wine. And so a lot of those people were the most fearless in accepting that grapes could be a great, uh, a great ingredient in, in any beverage, including a beer. Nice. Hmm. Now, uh, you, you have, I mean, aside from, from 61, you've, you've done quite a few music collaborations. Sean is, is, is drinking one of those, uh, that my, my personal favorite is, uh, you know, bitches brew, but, um, how did you get? How did you get the idea to to start pairing music and beer, which obviously goes goes together? You know, it, it's kind of in, it's always in the same sentence now. Yeah, and I, you know, and, and you think about why, and I think uh, you know, craft beer and sort of great music go hand in hand for a number of reasons. For for us, uh, you know, it started probably you know I'm as big of a music geek as I'm a beer geek, and I th almost time anytime you go to a brewery, there's great music playing. Um, and the way that music can be so diverse uh, and everyone has different tastes, the same should go for beer. Um, but for us, it probably started formally with our relationship with John Langford, who's the lead singer in the Mekons, which is a UK punk band that's been around since the Sex Pistols in the late 70s. And then he moved to the States and now is in a band called the Waco Brothers out of Chicago on Bloodshot Records, and he's also a fine artist. Uh, Village Voice named him American Artist of the Year, I think, in 08 or 09. And maybe 05 or 04, uh, probably nah, even earlier, 02, I'd say, I was at, there used to be an awesome cask beer festival in Chicago that Ray Daniels and Randy Mosier and a bunch of the original gangsters started. And uh, we won, Chicory Stout won Best of Show one year, and I had like, seven pints of chicory stout at this awesome bar and bought the artwork off the wall because I loved it. It was a Johnny Cash painting and I learned that night that it belonged to, that it was done by Johnny Langford and I was a big Mekons fan. So the owner of the bar that was showing this the show in his bar got Johnny on the phone. He came down and drank with me that night. 
Jeez. And uh, and then within months we were working on labels for Burton Baton, Old School, Immortale, uh, and Raison Dextra. Those are the four that he painted. And then that kind of got us on our journey of using our brewery as also a platform to celebrate the musicians we, we love and the artists we love. We use a lot of uh, artists from the, the rock and roll poster world or ro rock and roll art world to do our logos. I still love to paint our, our logos occasionally. I did the 61 label. I painted that. I painted Noble Rot and Festino Lente. But now we love incorporating outside artists that we want to turn people on to. The same way we love collaborating with breweries and wineries and uh, food companies that we want to turn people on to. So that's where it all started, though. Awesome. Uh, anyone else got a I mean, Sean, how's that? How's that bitches brew tasting? It's delicious. Uh, yeah. It's nice and roasty, a little bit, a little bit chocolatey. You don't really taste any of the uh, uh, nine percent alcohol. Um, you get a nice little like chocolate feeling right around your lips. It's kind of great. <laughs> are you Are you going to be drinking that whole bottle yourself tonight, Sean? Uh, no, my uh, my brother's going to be uh, coming over and <laughs> ah, clean up duty. Ah, oh, the second exactly. beer guy. <laughs> 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 What's the next uh, music beer is going to be the Grateful Dead one or? Yeah, you know, 61, we did a, a project with, uh, got another great friend of mine, uh, Will Oldham, Bonnie Prince Billy, who I've done short film with, and he's played at Dogfish, and we did a sort of theater beer show in Kentucky a few months ago. So that one just happened earlier this year. And so, yeah, in late September, uh, we're going to be launching American Beauty and the band chose the base style for the beer, which is like a big pale ale, all American ingredients. And then we sent out sort of a bat signal to the Grateful Dead community and asked them to submit stories and re ingredient ideas that A, they thought would work really well in a pale ale recipe, and B, they could tie back to some personal story about the Grateful Dead. And the winning story slash ingredient was granola. Uh, and the guy, the guy had a great story, and uh, it'll be told as, as the beer's... Uh, release, but we've been trialing all these different organic uh, granolas in the test batches that we're doing right now. So, uh, and then we'll do a West Coast launch with the band members and their archivist Dave and their manager Mark, and they got a great they got a great thing going in the dead community. Not just the music, but the community is pretty exemplary in terms of a grassroots movement uh, that certainly mirrors the way the craft brewing community has grown because of consumer um, empowerment more so than the man thrusting it down people's throats. For the for the Grateful Dead, wasn't there upwards of like in the teens of numbers of members who were actually in the band from the beginning? I would I had, last year I'd gone to the um, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and they it was there. They had the Grateful Dead um, as a tribute on the upstairs, and they showed all of the different people that were actually in the Grateful Dead from from the from the timeline. Yeah, I mean they're like Spinal Tap with combustible drummers, really. But <laughs> they, they 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 had a core group that's sort of recognized as the Grateful Dead, and then you had all these other fantastic artists that kind of came into their. Uh, their sort of orbit and then stayed in that orbit for a while and then moved on. Awesome. So a couple of weeks ago uh, concluded the Firefly Festival and uh, I know you guys have uh, partnered with them you know, to create the Firefly Ale and I was just wondering if you wanted to you know, talk a little bit to that and uh, what's the experience like working with such a successful music festival? Uh, it's pretty incredible since we're really, you know, we, we do like a, a hotel project here that we've done for 10 years called uh, 360 Experience where we we kind of took over and redesigned a harborfront hotel room and, it's, and it comes with like a, a, a dolphin kayak tour, a boat ride on our SS Dogfish to our pub, a tour of our brewery, a full library of beers and beer books and beer music. And, and really it's about getting people that love dogfish to come down and fall in love with the, not just, you know, our coworkers and seeing how amazing they are, but also how amazing and beautiful this area of coastal rural Delaware is. And so fireflies kind of that on steroids where you get 65,000 indie music loving people that converge, you know, on this field outside of Dover, our state capital, and it's only 20 minutes from our brewery, so the overlap there is huge. And then our, our brewery, since the day we opened, 
has had live music two days a week, and our only rule is it has to be original music, no cover bands, in the same way that Dogfish doesn't really try to cover anyone else's beers and kind of uh, doesn't really adhere to any styles. We try to do the same thing with our music program. So to be able to be the craft beer sponsor for uh, a festival, you know, where it's as, as diverse as, you know, Ken, this year we had, I saw Kendrick Lamar, the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs, Public Enemy, Vampire Weekend, uh, Foxygen, um, MGMT, you know, that is exactly in keeping what we're trying to do as a brewery where, you know, you can go from something really malty and sweet or sweeter like Midas and Raison to something super hoppy like 60 to something super exotic like Etrusca. Um, so we felt like they're, they're brothers from another mother, the people that run that festival, and we hope it's a, a long, long relationship. Well, I know I have, a, I have a group of friends that went down, and they're still talking about how amazing that festival was, and it was two weeks ago. So yeah. I've pretty much locked up my ticket for 2014. So I'm looking forward to coming down and hanging out in Delaware with you guys in 2014. So. Fine, I'll yeah. go. No, yeah. right. Brian, you're coming with. Norm. Fine. <laughs> you should all come. <laughs> as long so, as we can uh, use some of that dog for said soap. Yes, to clean up <laughs> in your tent. Yeah, yeah uh, normally it's more than anybody. But. So hey, kind of, you know. I use the shampoo. <laughs> we make that too. We make that too. So, kind of going on the theme of you know, you know, being original and being creative. Um, you know, back a while back when you guys had the show uh, Brewmasters, we got to see a little bit of a glimpse into kind of where ideas for new beers originate. And sometimes it's you know your employees at your brewery, sometimes history, sometimes you, sometimes just kind of happenstance. And I, I guess I wanted to know, you know, what would you say is the most you know common source of inspiration for your new brews, or you know, is it just Organic? Do you just kind of spitball stuff? What What's the process? You know, when you're when you're thinking of new ideas for both, you know, the pub and then maybe eventually something that becomes uh, production. Um, you know, it's pretty much all over the map. I still love being part of that creative process, and I'd say I'm still usually the one that take comes up with a paragraph worth of an idea that's so far away from what it ends up being in a bottle. You know, a year from me sharing that idea with the brewmaster and usually the pub brewer. Then I go down to the pub and do the trial batch, and Dogfish has never paid for sort of outside consultants or focus groups. What we do is do a, a trial batch or a pub, uh, usually do it once or twice, and usually take a couple six stills of it. And so it's not just served at our pub, but we'll bring a six still to the EBF up, up there or a GABF or CBC, and then get the input of our regulars at our pub and some hardcore beer people at a at a huge high profile event and just by gauging their excitement that's all it takes for us to make the decision to move that from a pub only two barrel batch up to you know uh, hundreds and hundreds of barrels into uh, production but you know a beer like 61 came from me and my friends in, in a bar drinking 60 with Pinot uh, whereas I just got back from Scandinavia uh, and brewed an ancient ale uh, outside of uh, um, uh, Copenhagen, where the where the remains were found, uh, with the molecular archaeologist and and uh, brewers over there. So sometimes history, and sometimes uh, we look we look uh, towards ourselves for inspiration. Sometimes we look towards history. Well, they're all tasty. So <laughs> where does inspiration come from? Tasty inspiration. Yeah, Norm. Yeah, I was just I was just curious. Uh, a lot of obviously a lot of the beers that you come out with have some. Uh, Unique ingredients. I'm just wondering what some of the beers that didn't make it out to the commercial market might have included that you like. You thought this is going to taste great, and you took that first sip, and it's like, you know, maybe it doesn't work so great. And I was wondering if you could share some of the uh, ones that never made it out to like the general public. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's, uh, you know, when we we actually at the same time that we're putting a 200 barrel brewing system next to our 100 barrel brewing system and uh, you know tripling our capacity we also ripped out the five barrel brewery from our pub and put in a two barrel brewery and uh, so that allows us to do more experiments and it allows us also when we uh, only you know sort of like an experiment instead of love it we can go through that two barrels a lot more easily or if it goes in a really bad direction we can dump it down the drain with minimal cost um, but yeah, there was some back in the day that we would brew that, um, you know, were either before their time or were just gross. Um, <laughs> and 
early batches of uh, Immortale where I, you know, 95, 96, there wasn't any manuals for wood aging a beer and just having so, like, almost like equal ratios of wood chips to liquid in a tank uh, made for a pretty um, stringent and uh, painful experience. And we did a beer with too much uh, lavender once and we got a comment bar back this is like 97, and the comment card said, it tastes like tongue-kissing Laura Ashley. So <laughs> that one was a keeper. Uh, Do you hang those up somewhere? That's I true. wish. That's no, awesome. I wish, I wish I saved it. I didn't. But then we'll do ones that are we still love, but they're commercially just unrealistic. Like we are, we've done chicha a few times where you use – the enzymes in your saliva to convert starches to sugars, and that's literally a physically painful beer to brew. And then uh, every year we do a beer called Chalk Lobster, where we do cocoa <laughs> cocoa nibs from our friends at Askinosi, and then lobsters from Dogfish Head uh, Peninsula in in Maine. And you're throwing all these live lobsters into a kettle, and it's you know that one. <laughs> Yikes. Many, many hundreds of dollars in, in lobsters in a five-barrel batch, and you can imagine what that would cost us in a 200-barrel brew house. So oh, yeah. we'll take a few kegs of that to the GABF and then serve the rest of the batch at our pub, but beers like that will likely never see uh, distribution. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. Uh, Sean, uh, we, so we have a chat room, and we, it's full of beer drinkers. Yeah, there's about seven people in the chat room right now. They're asking all sorts of different questions. It's kind of my... Job to kind of it's your duty, sir. Them put Find them together and kind of ones. make sense out of them. Um, both uh, Zach Rothman and Brandon Carter, they're kind of um, curious. I mean, we like to get a scoop here on the on the podcast every now and then, and um, we want to know if you know, I mean, there was asked if there's going to be any more numbered beers. Um, were there any sort sort of beers that you wanted to do, but either it took too much time or it cost too much and uh, there's kind of sort of the questions really is that what do you what do you have coming out next and maybe that you could share with us and would, were there different beers that you wanted to do at a bigger scale and just didn't work out? Um, uh, well, for the question on numbers, I mean, never say never, but I think we, the reason I moved 61 to a written word uh, was because it's 60 minute plus one ingredient. It's not 61, but I I also feel like we've got enough breadth of numbered beers in our portfolio for the moment. Um, so never say never, but nothing on the horizon for a different numbered uh, beer. Uh, we are actually, uh, you know, 75. We're going to, we, I know, uh, is a pretty popular beer. There you go. And, uh, and we'll be making more and more 75 minute. Um, but yeah, we'll stick with the number of numbered beers that we have. Um, what were the other questions? Sorry, that was the first one. Yep. No, the other part was more so like, uh, did you have some beers that you tried to make and it just didn't either work out well? Whether it was make it wasn't the right cost to make it, or it or it too, took too much time, or anything that really prevented you from, from you know, coming over the. No, I mean, you know, there there'll be beers that we don't think fit our portfolio well, or we feel you know. We, we never really look to the left or right of us for inspiration. We love seeing other breweries, you know, do their own creative thing. But if something's out there uh, that's already out there, we'll, we won't pursue that. Um, but we won't let cost stand in the way. For example, beer like Noble Rot, we're now the largest buyer of botrytis-infected grapes in America, including wineries. Each container that we get of that from Washington State is $82,000. So at whatever price we sell Noble Rot, I don't think we're making any money, but we love that beer, so we're going to continue making it. So we don't really let cost stand in the way of what we do, and we try to just be really transparent with our pricing. That's why it might be frustrating as a consumer to see, oh, you're going to Dogfish, why can't they just price everything the same or similar? And it's because we're really always shooting for roughly the same target cost of goods and the same target percentage profit that we put on top of that cost of goods to make sure our beers continue to be an affordable luxury, um, if that answers the question. Oh, that's, that's good. Do you have any more, Sean? Or? Yeah, just, no, it's more so of uh, if there's anything new that's coming out uh, that we might have not talked about yet that you might want to share with us today. I, well, I got one question that might it might lead to an answer um, from uh, at Danbo Smash. Tweets at us. Uh, is there any plans 
to do another gluten-free beer, perhaps a gluten-free brown ale. Um, we got no pr plans on the horizon because of the uh, production capacity, the c production um, challenges that producing a gluten-free beer in an otherwise non-gluten-free environment create, meaning we have to basically, you know, clean out our entire brewery from the grain mills through packaging on the days that we're processing Tweezenail because we get certified. Uh, somebody comes in and certifies us, and we test every single batch uh, to make sure it hits the standards. So, you know, I'd, I'd say that one's kind of a labor of love as, as well. Having one gluten-free beer is already a really ambitious project for us, and we love the Tweezen Ale. It drinks almost more like a Prosecco, uh, I think, than any of the gluten-free, you know, style referencing yeah. beers that are out there. So we'll keep making that one. Never say never on a second, but it's not something we're talking about for 2014. Gotcha. So, uh, Sam, the news of the day is that as of July 1st today, uh, home brewing is now legal or almost legal in 50 states. Woo! Yeah, uh, so we were wondering what your thoughts are on that. And uh, as a follow-up, are there any other beer laws that still exist, either in your state or nationally, that you'd like to see change? Uh, First of all, my hats off to the entire homebrewing community. Talk Let's raise a glass to that. Yeah. Yes. Cheers Woo! to all homebrewers. Cheers. Cheers to the uh, AHA and Gary, uh, basically the whole group at, at the Brewers Association that really focuses on the issues that face uh, the homebrewing community have been great catalysts along with the homebrewing uh, communities in every state that have gotten together and changed those laws. It's a huge, you know, cut, you know that's following... We had American Beer Week about a month ago where we had, you know, a toast in, and people participated in all 50 states. And then weeks later, we make homebrewing legal in all 50 states. And just this is an incredible, like, uh, national movement. And it's amazing to see that solidarity actually moves the needle legislatively and in terms of market share. The craft brewers are gaining market share. The question of are there any laws that I wish uh, would go away? Um, I think all small breweries to be viable, we have severe access to market challenges uh, where the largest uh, breweries are, you know, frankly creating bran branch legislation where they own their own distributorships. Uh, in the case of Anheuser-Busch, owning is actually very quietly not just the biggest brewery in the world, but is the largest distributor of beer in America. Um, and, and so with the, the distribution channels being limited, uh, it becomes uh, very challenging. So breweries and their state guilds working with the state wholesaler groups to say, hey, it's really good for both of our businesses, our, our entrepreneurial local businesses, to make this an accessible marketplace for even the smallest nanos to get a chance to get to the taps and the shelves that are out there. Which I, I, I got to raise another toast, even though, I mean, we've, we're drinking the whole show, but I, I'll raise another toast to that because the, the relationships that craft brewers have with each other, and we see this, we've been doing this for 40 episodes, and, and every time we, we talk to a brewer, they talk about other brewers, which yeah. I think is, is just is, is, is amazing because it, it's not really for, for fight's sake, but you, you guys actually like each other and, and you guys cooperate pretty well. And, and I think that's, that's you don't see that in uh, many other industries. I mean, speaking of which, I'm, I'm drinking the Rising oh. Vines, the collaboration with Sierra Nevada. It's awesome, by the way. This is my first sip of it. It really, really kicks butt. But, but the, that spirit of collaboration and kind of trying to do what's right for the whole group is, is really cool. I, amen, and, and uh, I, I was on the phone with Brian Grossman from Sierra Nevada, who's second generation, and he's going to be running their East Coast facility on my way home tonight, and uh, we're talking about an, an event that we're going to be doing in North Carolina where we've rented out a theater, and we're going to be doing all kinds of hard-to-find beers uh, from both our breweries with great food and a band. And yeah, it's. I mean, this is the most special thing about our community. It's not just that amazing solidarity and tour between craft brewers, but how much it extends to the, the consumer and the advocates like you guys, it being one community. This doesn't really happen in the wine world. You wouldn't see a pro-am award at the biggest wine event in the country the way you see a pro-am award at the GABF. You know, the amateur and the consumer and the craft brewing community is all kind of aligned and in lockstep with each other. And I hope with this influx of 
new brewers to breweries a day, we can maintain this solidarity even as shelf space becomes more precious. Two, two breweries a day. Good, <laughs> good gravy. <laughs> I mean, what Norman, Norman Sean, and Mike, the Massachusetts, was it two years ago? There was four, like how many that year? I mean, I mean, three years ago, I thought it was huge when eight breweries opened one year, and now, yeah. like, eight? Eh, who cares? Yeah, forget it. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, that, yeah, we have, we have in Maine right now 18 in planning just this second, you know, and it changes daily, but it's. It's awesome to see, and honestly, I'm happy that people are fulfilling their dreams. You know, we'll see how they all turn out, but I'm just, it's such an exciting time to be a part of this. Uh, man, I guess... Th more collaborations this, lined up, or...? Yeah, do you have any more, uh, any more uh, collabs? More collaborations lined up. We're kind of at a moment where we, we uh, have our, we're talking about our music uh, collab for 2014, and we're talking about our ancient liquid project for 2014 but we're you know what we're doing with uh, Sierra and what we're doing with the two Italian breweries Piero del Borgo and Baladan are uh, what we have kind of on our horizon what my wife's telling me something oh and then yeah, yeah actually I, I should, it's not a new project but it's an awesome project which is every other year we do batches of Saison de Buff with our yes. pal, pals at uh, at Victory Brewery and at Stone, Mariah that's and fun. I, that's we love that's that one. Wow. And we're we're all music heads, and we had uh, dinner Mariah and, and our kids and uh, and Bill Kovaleski from Victory and his kids were down on vacation in Rehoboth last week, and we were arguing with them and over which bands suck and which ones were good that played Firefly, and it was a great moment to be having a multi generation generational argument among the Victory family and the Dogfish family about, about music, and I hope our kids are doing that with their kids someday. Definitely. So I just have to bring something up right now. I was trying to think of good rock collaborations, and I'm going to go on record right now. My favorite band of all time is Third Eye Blind. Can you please brew a rye IPA and call it Third Rye Blind? <laughs> I, will, I will come down there and help you do anything you need <laughs> to get this going. I just, I just thought of that like right now, and I'm just that, like, throwing it right bad. to the source. That's not that's we're gonna put that in the idea box, Michael. <laughs> right, which is the garbage yeah. can right no. here. <laughs> no. yeah. The circular oh, filing cabinet. Better band than Third Eye Blind. But, you should hear all the ideas he has for the podcast. We put in the same spot. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they cut my vocals out of everything. Come on. Awesome. Well, so I, I guess we can go. We can kind of dive deep in into uh, getting to something real hard hitting, real like actor studio type question because we uh, if you we guys make about... me cry this I'm just signing up. No, there's no, no crying no, no. in the podcast. Oh, no. <laughs> no crying if, in fear. No. If we no. had serious music we'd play it. But no, um so we have been talking about, you know, relationships being being a, a big part of, of the of the craft beer microbrewery industry. I I'd like to know your thoughts on how you I mean you've you've been around for, for years obviously. What how have you seen craft beer grow and what 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 would you say is the state of craft brewing at this point in time I'd say it's the most exciting moment in my history to be a craft beer maker and a craft beer drinker in terms of you know when I when when I would go to a festival in 97 or 98 beer festival and I'd have a beer with raisins in it or licorice root or whatever that generation of of beer drinkers in general you know would would be affect you know offended by it and say hey you know that's pathetic that you guys are screwing with traditions this is disrespectful to brewing da 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 da, da. and you know now i was at the AHA's national convention in philadelphia last week and you know so many you know homebrewers coming up and telling me the crazy shit that they're brewing, but also that we've been a great inspiration to them and opened up a lot of doors for people that brew outside of styles has been really really rewarding. So to be at a moment today where not just nationally but globally, um, you know people are so adventurous um, is just wonderful. And we at Dogfish, you know, we've always said that the Rhine Heights Kibbutz are a relatively modern form of art censorship. And for many, many years, we felt like uh, we were kind of saying that 
you know, fairly isolated, and now it feels like there's hundreds of people on hundreds of mountaintops saying it along with us, and it's a, a chorus, and events like the EBF are a testament to its momentum. I'm, I'm satisfied with that answer, folks. Yeah. Anyone else? Satis <laughs> <laughs> Who's not satisfied? You can leave the... <laughs> <laughs> So I have a couple people that are bugging me on Twitter um, about specific places in which your beer is distributed, and I, you know, and, and we've talked about this on, um, you know, on other podcasts, not about your beer specifically, but just, you know, there's a financial decision always, you know, in deciding where your beer goes. Um, but I have people asking about, is there any chance you guys are ever going to distribute to Canada and or Alabama? Um, those are those are what people are bugging me about on, on Twitter. So I figured I'd just ask, throw it out there. Um, see what your kind of plans are on that. Um, Canada or Alabama? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the heart, the heart know, land. They, 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 the people people the people nation's care. heartland. Uh, we only entertain new markets that have at least five A's in their in the name of. <laughs> <laughs> so they almost made it, but I don't know. Um, okay. Actually, we we love Tor Toronto and and. Uh, Montreal are awesome beer towns. The Beer Bistro is one of my favorite places in Toronto. Uh, du De Seal is one of my favorite breweries in the world in Montreal. Um, and we just won the, the biggest award at Mondial de Beer up there. So we'd love to get back to Canada at some moment in our history. But uh, we just announced last week that we're re-entering the four states we pulled out of. So, okay. you, you know, we are, that's kind of all we Progress have. in a positive direction. Yeah. That's cool. It's all good. Exactly. So yep. we're going to we're going to get into those states in the fourth quarter of this year. And then after that, we shall see what we shall see. But we really do listen to, you know, Mar Mariah, who's no longer in the room, so I can brag on my wife yes. a little bit, right. Here we go. Is, is the one who kind of gives us a great, uh, feeling of of because she's the one that answers all our Twitter and Facebook and and uh, that kind of stuff. So she can really understand where the most interest is coming to. Or we look at the kind of uh, you know Google the metrics on where people are visiting our website from, and that does influence our discussions of of other other uh, markets that we'll consider in the, in the near future. So tell Alabama and Canada to keep doing their crazy interweb thing. Do they even have the internet in Canada? They're still no. working on it. Right? Oh, that's oh, I had to. I, I, I would know. say between yeah, Alabama I and Canada, probably. Canada. I know. Yeah. <laughs> great, <laughs> great beer. Great beer, only dial up. So right, fifty six k. Hard to get up. <laughs> Nothing much crazy. Uh, but uh, Sean, you you have a question? Yeah, yeah, Sam, if it's okay, I have a a couple different random ones from the uh, from the chat room and beyond. If that's okay, a little, little firing squad at you. Um, first off, uh, really quick, uh, there's another guy named Beer Nut today. I guess didn't realize that until now, but uh, he wanted to know if you had any, um, if you could just give an insight what hops are used in the Firefly besides Calypso. Uh, there, uh, there's Calypso in there, but we're not really saying the other ones. What we do say is that it's I will also say it's made with Maris Otter barley from, from the UK. And so really all what we say about that recipe, we keep a little mystery to it is because uh, it's celebrating an indie rock festival. So it's, we say it's brewed with Maris Otter uh, malt, uh, English malt, because uh, the Sex Pistols invented uh, punk rock and West Coast uh, hops, American hops, because the Ramones invented punk, punk rock. And then we leave it at that. So... Uh, right. Calypso is one of the hops, though. That's fair. Uh, another question, well, it's kind of question slash comment. Um, there were, you know, I mean, it's kind of the elephant in the room right now. Uh, yeah. and I'll, I'll just read it as is from Brad. Um, he said that he heard that the that moved up on me. Uh, he heard that the from I don't know why he, he heard that the that the TV show might have been canceled due to pressure of big brewers and ad revenue. That's a pretty bold statement. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I learned a great lesson in making that show, and I was very proud of my show, and very proud of myself, my very coworkers, true. and the other brewers around the around the world that were in that show. Uh, but I did learn a great lesson about how big uh, networks uh, that do sort of uh, re reality program work with big advertisers. And I'll just leave it at that and say, now more than ever, it's important to uh, support your indie craft breweries. Okay, just a couple other questions and I, I appreciate that one um, a lot of brewers we've seen um, that are uh, going to the opposite direction of the coast to start up a second brewery does Dogfish Head have any 
plans or thoughts or wishes or desires to possibly do uh, have a location on the West Coast? Well, I think a reason why you generally mean it's not it's not um, just a coincidence that almost every second location brewery that's been announced or constructed is a, a first location West Coast brewery building a second location <laughs> East Coast brewery. And that's generally because um, most of what's grown in America moves from the West heartland to the East where there's more people. So trucking is more expensive coming west and a lot of trucks deadhead from the east empty back to where they originated in the west so east coast breweries only pay about a half per case of what it costs to ship a beer the same amount of miles uh, that the west coast breweries ship when they ship east so that's sort of the reality from an economic perspective but I think there can be really interesting other reasons to explore at, at other locations uh, for instance we do Dogfish, Baladan, and Borgo do the beer for the Beereria, which is in America, Joe Bastian, Mario, and then the Italian folks. And we have a Beereria brewery in New York. We have one in Rome, and we just recently announced that there'll be a, a, a five hectoliter with 10 hectoliter tanks uh, in a Beereria in Chicago. So I could see projects like that that we're involved with out in the West Coast, but to put in significant capacity, we're kind of like the model of doing everything in Milton for as long in Delaware for as long as we can. Fantastic. Thanks. That no, that makes a lot of sense too. And I, I guess the the one last question I have before moving on to someone else was that um, besides your own beer, is there a particular brewery or a beer that is maybe your go-to or something that if you see it available, you you have that first? Um, I'd say. Uh, we probably, other than Dogfish, have the most uh, Sierra in our house because uh, of our relationship with the, with the brewery, but also because I think their QC is top-notch and uh, the odds that the beer you buy wherever you are is going to be good is, uh, is among the highest. There's hundreds of other breweries with great QC. So I'd say, you know, in the last week, you know, I've had Switchback beer. I've had uh, beer from... Rogue. I've had beer from Victory. I've had uh, beer from whoever makes the Ginger Man Stout from somewhere down south. That we had one of those, um, and I had a saison de Pont. So you can see them kind of all over the map. Oh, and I was in uh, Philly, and I had some uh, beer de Borgo, and I had a Yards IPA on cask, and that was nice. all in the last five days. So you can see it. <laughs> well played. In Sounds front like of a different group, too, yeah. In front of a different group, I'd feel guilty. But you guys are sh putting up new labels every three minutes, and I'm still in the same, <laughs> same 20, 22. I'm I'm the slow one. I brought a knife to a gunfight. <laughs> oh man, uh, Sean, is that it for the uh, the chat yep. the chat room there? Yep. I think Carla's got one more. Then we can kind of yeah. I, I have kind of a silly question to end it on. But when is the new pain? Oh. <laughs> album coming out. Oh, Say it one more time, Carla. No? Wait. When, when is the new Pain oh, Relievous right. album? Yeah. <laughs> more. I couldn't tell if you had a bad connection from you or oh, if that I... was like a hip-hop remix. He's breaking no. into it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not that tall. Drop the bass. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Bring the action. Uh, yeah. Well, the good, <laughs> the, the good news is my my fellow pain reliever is coming back into the beer business. My buddy Brian Selders, who had dinner here at my house Friday night, um, left Dogfish to be a graphic artist maybe four years ago or so, and he's going to be a, a head brewer at a brewery in, that's opening in Colorado. So now that he's back in the industry, I could see like a uh, you know a, a reunion tour somewhere on our. Uh, horizon, uh, but not not this year or next. But yeah, someday I'd love to do another Pain Relievers album. Can we expect a line like a, a threesome with my homie uh, Thomas Hardy in the next album? Or <laughs> yeah, shout outs to all your favorite dead uh, patriots from around the world are are probably gonna make make it in there. <laughs> someday we might even be playing Firefly. You never know. Yes, <laughs> next year while I'm there. Nice. <laughs> Uh, all right, um, and I saw on YouTube recently that uh, the Brewers Association has a great YouTube page, and, and they, they post every time that uh, that you're on on either a news show or anything anything else going on. But they posted something 
you have a your own sausage line coming out. Yeah, that's uh, something we're pretty excited about. We've been doing you know food centric beers since we opened. I mentioned our inspiration was the entire culinary landscape, and we opened in a brew pub because we were brewing these complex food friendly beers, and we used the kitchen for our, our brewery and our our our, our, our stoves. Um, so this year we kind of uh, wanted to. Uh, magnify our, our our overlap of of food and beer, and have come out with a line of packaged uh, foods that are made with our beer. Um, you can get the uh, hardtack chowder, which has some 60 minute in it, and it's a canned clam chowder uh, that's reconstituted with you, you can reconstitute with Palo Santo Marron, uh, and then. Uh, we have a line of all natural brats infused with chicory stout, raison d'etre, um, and Midas touch, and with ingredients like feta and espresso beans, and really, really unique sort of off-centered bratwurst recipes, four packs that are uh, available at Milton Brewery at our food truck there now, but will be in distribution up and down the East Coast in the coming weeks. Awesome. And then we do we do a hop-infused pickle uh, where we send our, a, redu a salted tote of our 60-minute to a pickle uh, dude, our buddy Seamus at Brooklyn Brine in New York, and we also use Cascade Hop Oil in the brine for that as well. So the food collabs that we're doing are, are pretty exciting. We Again, trying to be uh, trying to do our own thing. I don't think a brewery's come out with a whole line of of beer infused uh, uh, packaged foods, uh, but we think it's a really natural extension for us considering our recipe DNA on the beer side. Can I, can I ask a follow up to that? Is sure. there anywhere I can get those like hot pickles? I saw something about that and I was like, I want them. Yep, I mean, just right off at dogfish.com. You can order them. Okay. Nice. Yep, yep. Good to know. Yep. Sweet. Yep, I and I should that. say we're going to be. Uh, I'm going to be doing uh, a sh I'm not sure if they're going to be featured or not, but I'm on the Today Show on Wednesday morning. I'm going up to New York City to talk about uh, pairing different foods with summer beers. And I think I'm doing a couple of dogfish beers, a Sierra beer, and I think I'm doing Magic Hats, Hefeweizen on that show. So I'm psyched to be showing off a bunch of different beers from a bunch of different brewers on the nice. Today Show. Yeah. I hope, yeah, but I if hope you Matt, Matt Lauer has got to be a huge beer fan. Or, I mean, you, you know, Al Roker. You should tell yeah. him about the podcast. <laughs> I will. I'll, I'll try to tell him about it. I'll try. <laughs> one time on one time on the Today Show, Katie Couric and, and uh, Matt Lauer were drinking our Midas Touch, and he said, and this is like 99, 2000, when I didn't even know if Dogfish was going to make it. And it was a big moment for our brewery, national television. And uh, Mar Matt Lauer takes a sip of, nine, of Midas Touch. He's like, wow, that's really good. And Katie Carr goes, yeah, and what's nice is it's sweet. So women like it too. And he kind of spits out the beer and goes, oh, you mean I'm drinking chick beer? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Classic Lauer. <laughs> Classic Lauer. I'm a, I'm a today show. Go, no, go ahead, please. <laughs> You're a Today Show junkie. I'm, I'm, yeah, because you know I, I got nothing to do in the morning, so it's either it's either kind of editing the podcast or watching the show downstairs. So right, I'll be watching for sure. <laughs> yeah, but if you're on the Today Show, haven't you jumped the shark at that point? Yeah, that's what they say, you know, right? Jump the dolphin. I mean, it's it's interesting. <laughs> that, is, that is an interesting and uh, and unfortunate uh, uh, reality. I think a little bit in the craft beer community, which is the phenomena that I call that restaurants too busy, nobody eats there anymore, where, you know, the, 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 the real grassroots, uh, hardcore, you know, militant, passionate craft beer lovers um, who, uh, who are, are always talking about beer online, I think they kind of go in two directions, either the beer geek direction where you're just excited about positively sharing your passion for which beers you love uh, and you have great knowledge, and the beer snob direction. Which is the other direction where you probably you know just as much as the beer geeks, but you kind of use your knowledge to kind of lord over other folks and try to influence them and try to prove you know more than they do by kind of finding the most obscure beers in the world and only liking them until other people can reach them and then trying to find the next obscure beer. And that's, I think, a dangerous place for our industry to go, you know, that collectively a brewery like ours, just because we're on the Today Show, we still only have one fifteenth of one percent market share. We're still tiny, and I know I'm psyched when Jim Cook's on television or Ken Grossman or you know Rob Todd 
because I'm excited that more people that aren't beer beer geeks yet are learning about beer and might become beer geeks. So I hope as we get to two breweries a day that people don't just start saying, oh, this whole movement's jumping the shark because all these other people are, are joining our community. We need all these people to join our community if, if we're going to make it. So I'm sorry to end on a soapbox, but you guys gave me this soapbox, so I'm standing on it. Nice. I mean, yeah, that's fine. But hey, I mean, we have you have time for two more questions, and then uh, Sean will end with with a nice moment of Zen uh, kind of question. <laughs> but uh, uh, Carly, you have a you have a very pressing question. Uh, do I? Oh, okay. Do you? Uh, uh, no, sorry. From Twitter again. No, so from. Oh, Twitter, right. From Twitter again uh, is a question about um, you know there's a lot of breweries canning now. Is is there any plans or thoughts about you guys uh, entering kind of that canned beer world? Oh, um, if I answer this wrong, are you going to get me with that compound bow that's on no. your <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, the camera, camera the other way. There's like no, 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 no. Uh, All right, there's two of them. They're wet. Yeah. <laughs> torture chamber in there. <laughs> that's Norm's house. There's only one beer, babe. You know why? <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, to that, I'd say never say never. I love that you can get great craft beers in a can now. There's nothing on Dogfish Head's immediate uh, horizon uh, for that. We just put in a really beautiful growler station in our tasting room and food truck at our Milton Brewery. Um, so we, that's our newest addition to our packaging family. And then our giant Crohn's bottling line that we built a whole new building behind our brewery uh, goes online in September. So that's, our, that's as far as we can see right now. But I, I do love that there are great beers that you can finally have in a can. I got nothing against that movement. I got only love cool. for it. Very cool. So, uh, you know, Sam, we've been following the brewery for quite some time, even though our, and a lot of our, our a lot of everyone on the, the podcast here has been um, found passion from what you've done to be able to help and build up for what we've been doing um, since we've started, and we really appreciate that. Um, I just want to throw in before I say the last part is that someone mentioned some dog for said pizza dough, maybe with maybe with made with one twenty minute um, IPA. Um, never say never again. Never but I'm going to put that in the can category. <laughs> But we just wanted to we just wanted to kind of get your word. There's a lot of people out there going to listen to this, and you you came up through like the hard times to be able to push it through and to make a brand almost pretty much out of nothing and to be able to uh, to have so many people passionate to try what you've made next and to and to just give you a chance. And do you have some advice out there for any of the new breweries that are starting? I think 700 and 60 odd breweries started last year, and there's another like a thousand uh, odd breweries this year. So, 70, just maybe end on some good advice out there for. Yeah. I, 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 I get that question a lot. You know, I wrote a book called Brewing Up a Business, and, and uh, it's kind of about everything that we struggled through. My wife calls it screwing up a business. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're pretty honest with our challenges, and so when aspiring brewers email me, I do try to get back to them. Um, and I really say, success in this era boils down to three things and it's uh, beers you need to be successful you need to be, brew beers that are uh, distinct um, that are consistent and are well differentiated from what's already in the marketplace and I'd say uh, distinct you know when I started in the mid 90s um, you could get away with maybe being two out of those three and sometimes even maybe one out of those three when you when you started going but our beer market and the beer IQ of drinkers today is so much more sophisticated than in the mid 90s that they're not going to forgive inconsistency and they're not going to uh, support brewers that are just doing derivative things of other brewers um, so I'd say those three things are the key to making it uh, for the next five years you know perfect wow. Sean satisfied with that Solid advice. Bam. Uh, well, I mean, we we're at, we're at a solid hour, and, and we can't take much up, take up much of your time. But we really appreciate you, you coming on, Sam. And I I uh, I like to uh, give a quick shout out um, to to Dogfish and all the information is on the show notes. If you go to sblpodcast.com, links to your Instagram, YouTube, Untapped, blog, 
Twitter, Facebook, it's all up there. I mean, there's, there's not a chance in hell after watching or listening to this that you will not know how to follow Dogfish on any of the social media sites. Um, <laughs> well, well, well done by your, by your social media team because uh, you, you, you've nailed every, every good one. You, you, yeah. you didn't do MySpace, which I appreciate. Maybe once, the, <laughs> once you start rapping again, you might be on that. Hey, you never know, man. MySpace could come back. <laughs> oh, boy. No, 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 it can't. And third, and third Eye Blind could come back, too. Nice. No, no, no. I'm telling you, man. Oh, third right. ride blind. It's right there. You right just gotta there. grab it. <laughs> so, um, like I said, uh, for, for those that are listening and watching, uh, sblpodcast.com for for all the other episodes. A couple of upcoming ones before we close out the show. We have Bill Herlicka of White Birch coming up. We have the Throwback Girls coming up. We have Night Shift Brewing, Newburyport Brewing Company, and uh, Uinta Brewing coming up. All that's on the show notes, and again, um, Sam will like to do at the end of every show is, is raise a pint to you guys, and not just you, all the, all the crew at Dogfish, everything that helps make you do what you do easier and better, and we appreciate it. So cheers, and we appreciate it. Thank yeah. you guys for cheers. spreading Thank you for spreading the word about good beer, guys. Thank you for what you do from all of us at Dogfish. Cheers. Cheers, Thanks. cheers guys. You're here. Cheers.